Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Eshaw Cycling Podcast with three cycling nerds. Well, actually, two cycling nerds and a professional cycling journalist. More about that later. Talk about what's been happening in the week of cycling. And uh, yeah, it is, of course, Patrick Blake of Audu Cycling and Mr. Ewan Wilson of Cyclist. So, um, yeah, uh, big week. Uh, Tour of Basque Country, Arrow Bay, Machu Wadapur, obviously, and lots to talk about. So, I mean, what's been happening, guys? Everything seemingly uh but it's seemingly the whole season has been completely flipped on its head by one singular corner in Basque country which is completely mad uh if i'm sure everybody's seen that and then the yeah, air cobbles of a weekend with um obviously the women's because we're all you know in- inclusive so I, I did watch that, that event as well and then I watched the men's race. Arguably, you could say that the women's was more entertaining. I reckon. Um, some people not particularly enthralled with just Vanderpool soloing off to victory again, which I can get. I get that. But at the end of the day, it is also kind of cool to have a world champion. Two world champions winning. Uh, Paris Bay. So, I think overall, Basque Country was a little bit of a disaster. But Paris Roubaix were pretty cool. Um, this week felt like you know you know when you're like sitting in a room and you have maybe three different people all on their phones playing different things at the same time. Like someone's got a song playing, someone's scrolling through TikTok, and somebody else is watching BBC News live. You know, this is what this week felt like. There was just so much going on at the same time and hard to concentrate on one thing because it just felt like we were being bombarded with terrible headlines. But I mean Pyro Bay, I don't think it had the same pizzazz this year. Maybe that's just me, but a three-minute lead in the end, wow, we're witnessing greatness. But I'm a little bit tired of witnessing greatness. Although it is, I mean, it it it, it, it is a great achievement for him in the rainbow jersey, yada, yada, yada. But once again, the women, women's race delivered. Women's race was far more entertaining. We had twists and turns and everything you could have wanted. Whereas in the men's race, it felt like, you know, from 60k out, you can just skip to the end. That race could have been an email. Um, and then also, I mean, Basque Country, there was just, I, I, I think everyone crashed in Basque Country. What, what was supposed to be like like the mini Avengers Endgame became just an Endgame. Um, with Vingegaard crashing really hard, Aignapol and Roglic all sort of leaving the best country wobbling, you know? I mean, uh, Roglic, he has uh, since then also uploaded a photo of him uh, semi-nude as well, as he seems to do after every crash. Yeah, I was about to say that's not the first time he's done that. But he can he can get, he can can get wash all his sorrows away in his beautiful hand scrubber shower, oh, wow. um, which he'll be stepping into after taking that photo. Um, probably one of the more painful showers to be had under a hand scrubber shower head. And maybe in six months' time, you can pop a Red Bull and feel so much better afterwards. I wonder what Alperson shampoo would feel like on <laughs> Salanti shoe. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Caffeine Honestly shampoo. Mm-hmm. What did Visma even do? Sorry. I need to go to this What the hell do you do? Visma. Oh, no, no. Business software. Oh, that's exciting. <sighs> no, that's boring. I can't even make like a... I can't even engineer a, like a funny comment yeah. for that one. Come on. Do, do better sponsors. <laughs> Well, Lisa bike is pretty evident. Um, but I mean, Paro Bay, uh, plenty of things happening despite both of you knocking it down a bit. I thought it was very impressive to see Ups and De Koenig do their best as a team. Patrick and I have pretty much said that they were going to do this in the previous show, so Little Trek should have listened. Uh, Mespil isn't getting on the podium. He was very happy about that, or maybe not. Uh, Lawrence Piffy, that who you both are quite high on as well, seventh place in his first season, uh, first race, well, first Paris Bay edition, even crashing, and but still getting inside the top ten. But yeah, you and what was the thing you told uh, Patrick and I before recording that was quite astounding about this Melissa bike? They seem to not be able to catch a break here. Yeah, I mean, they had a pretty torrid day. Dylan Van Bala pulled out last minute, didn't even start this race. Um, Laporte came back, but he was still recovering from illness. I mean, the whole wow situation, we know about that. But in the end, the Van Dijk brothers delivered, but one core headlines for the wrong reasons. Tim Van Dijk uh, was in that sort of peloton group that finished um, from 8th through to 16th place. 
And in the final sprint of the line in the Roubaix Velodrome, you can see Van Dijker go inside the track, almost like he was trying to cut the corner. There's no corner to cut, it's a straight line, bro. He went for that and soon got relegated to 16th place at the back of that group. Um, So, not great for him, but, I mean, only a couple places above him. Can we can we just give a shout out to Yevgeny Fedorov, who was absolutely brilliant today in Paris Bay? Not much of a sprinter, but he was just in that main body of riders for a lot of the day and I think delivered a really, really strong result for Astana Kazakhstan. I don't think anybody had them down to finish higher than Vizma Lisa by today. And Sudal. May I point that one out? Serious? Who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Remember them? Who <laughs> hey, I saw Al's Green in the break, and that was the last I saw him. I just dropped off of a cliff. I think he finished like 88th position. That seems to run well. Oh, yeah. I think the um, land part was the highest. He was like 30 something. Well, oh, great. It's bleak for them. Remember, they used to win this race. They used to, they used to dominate. The they used to box. win. Full stop. Uh, come on, come on. Oh, to be fair, Merlier, Merlier, to be fair. oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Merlier that- once held the price. Let's mention that now so we don't have to talk about that race again. Are you the fastest sprinter now in the world? I guess, but then Phillips wasn't taking the risks, you know. Yeah. Phillips was boxed in. Like, mm-hmm. he, he came from further back and came with more speed. So I, I still think it's up for debate. Um, yeah, yeah. And Vance held the price. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in terms of Pyro Bay, the big thing was safety, big concern, the chicane. I saw it firsthand, I rode it, it what a fast that was. Machibanapo, obviously one of the critics of this, and then uh, we saw it then in the race and it was a bit more shined up. And uh, yeah, what did you think of this? I mean, it looked like it was good, it was a small group that came to the chicane. I think it was just rubbish, to be honest. I think... Because I said this to you, Scott, before recording, I said that the race organisers were lucky that Alpsin had shredded the race down to 30 to 40 riders because it was borderline acceptable with that number of riders. If you had anywhere near 100 riders, which there usually are at that point of the race, it would have been but absolute chaos because there were people already at a standstill on the inside of that curve trying to get a dive bomb. Mass Pedersen was already accelerating on the cobbles by the time that the last person who was like Pidcock actually, not only it might have been or it was somebody else, I don't know, but by the time that they actually got round the chicane. And I also just didn't like how they had a whole big screen and like media area seemingly set up at the end of the Arenberg Trench so that people could see this chicane. It's like I don't know if people were spending money to get into that area, but if it is, then that was just a complete money grab. There's got to be a different way of making the entrance into that sector safer. There isn't some hashy announced one week before the race started chicane. Yeah, that's what made it feel a bit weird because it was only announced a couple days beforehand and that sparked all this debate and... You had riders posting their opinions. Matteo Jorgensen posted a, a picture of a rider with blood all over themselves saying, is this what you want? You had Adam Hansen having Twitter arguments with tweets filled with poor punctuation and spelling. Sorry, just had to say it. It bothers me greatly. How can you be be the head of the writers' union but not have a strong enough grasp of the English language to understand homophones? Sorry. Anyways. We don't need more enemies on this posh card, do you think? <laughs> Especially <laughs> not Adam Hansen. I'm so, it, it, it's been bothering me for so long that he, like, he just, I don't know. Yeah, grammar. Anyways. Um, what I actually brought was just a very sausage peloton. And a lot of tension. There, there was so much build-up to that chicane. Nobody knew how it was going to go. And in the end, it just kind of felt a bit pointless. And as you said, in that smaller group, it didn't lead to any crashes, but you could see why it could lead to a crash. Also, it just looked a little bit weird um, on the overhead camera shot. And in reality, did it prevent crashes? Maybe. But riders then had to, to had to start from like a standstill, which also creates a very hectic atmosphere as, as it previously had. Yes, you, you eliminate the speed aspect, but I mean... The combo sector is just as, as difficult as it was beforehand. I mean, you've ridden them. I've ridden them now, yes. actually, on the second second time. And I feel like coming with speed is safer in some regard. Yeah, because you don't have to like think about where you're going. You know, I was probably riding at the same pace that Mass Payson was after he 
had, had that chicane briefly and then he probably eclipsed my speed. Don't know why I said probably, he definitely did. But, I mean, speed definitely helps. But, I mean, this whole debate kind of took away from the Ruby experience, I feel. Because there was just so much debate beforehand about it. And I think it kind of killed the atmosphere, to be honest. Do you know what this reminded me of? Do you remember when there was that gridding system in the tour that was just a complete oh. gimmick? Does it was it does it give off that kind of vibe? Very similar vibe, yeah. Complete, utter useless thing, which attracted so much attention, but actually influenced very little. Mm. They wanted to be Enico Tour Golden Kilometer, but what they actually were was Tour de France 2018 grid system. You know, nobody wants to be the grid system. No. People should just leave the golden kilometer alone. It's already been taken. It, you can't beat it. You can't just start trying to make your own. You missed the boat. Accept the consequences and move on. Well, anyways, why do fans hate Macho Wonderful? Big question. Big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because he's winning too much. I can be the only reason that I can see why people must be upset with him because he wins too much. Is that his fault? I guess you could say yes. Could you say that it's the fault of his rivals? Could you say that they need to stop uh, losing? Could you could, could you put could you put the blame somewhere else and say can these guys get better? Like I don't know. Probably like you can't just say Vanderpool needs to sandbag and be I don't know handicapped in order to make the racing more entertaining. That's just complete. Like it's so ludicrous to believe that that could be a thing. People throwing whatever caps into the path of Matthew Van Der Poel's wheel to try and get it stuck in his derailleur is absolutely abysmal behavior. Like, please just don't do that. And then, yeah, what, what do you want? Do you just want Van Der Poel to not win? Do you not want... It's like people just like, oh, I don't like it when... It's like Jonas wins t- went too much of a tour or when Poggy wins too much of a tour. People just go, eh, I like it, but I like it to a, a certain extent. And then I want it to stop. It's like, well, you can't have it both ways. You just have to kind of go through the phase that Matthew Van Der Poel is the best when he doesn't have adequate competition there. He also got booed at the Tour of Flanders and hurled abuse at there, which was like... That's just Belgians, though. They're just yeah, but... Because Wout's not good enough. But this guy is born in Belgium. So and he's the world champion. Like, yeah, show it's... some respect. Come on. That's, that's not what... That's not what his flag says. Here's my hot take of the day. Um, I don't. Not, necessarily... not that Adam Hansen thing. That wasn't the hot take. That wasn't. That wasn't the hot take. That was just truth. <laughs> this might not be true. That person throwing the hat in the way. Do we even know if it was intentional? I, People. I think it did. It did look like she was almost. I don't know. It looked like she could have definitely been like trying to applaud, and then it kind of like it was like a bit of a flick, and it just like accidentally went out of her. But even even so, stop being clumsy at bike race and trying and like inadvertently. Almost causing something to happen. Restrain yourself. Restrain Opio me all over again. Oh, oh was a whole, not Opio me. Um, there was a whole conspiracy theory that somebody took a screenshot and said, This looks like the Opio me person, and they're back trying to like spoil bike racing again. Oh, gosh. Gosh. Don't allow women near bike races. That's all I'm saying. We're only one step reasons away. That is a joke. I'm not being serious. But. I think I I think it is just fatigue of him winning and winning in such a dominant fashion because he, people weren't sort of poo pooing him, he poo poo, uh, people weren't, weren't, weren't poo pooing him when he was winning Amstel Gold in the final fifty meters or when he was edging out Wild Van Aert in a photo finish back at the at the Tour of Flanders a couple of years back. It's now just because he's winning by minutes and minutes and minutes off the, off the front. I think people are getting a little bit bored of that, but hey ho. You know, it's bike racing. This happens in professional sport. If you don't, if you don't like like that, watch something else. You know, the Premier League and football—that's really close right now. You can't get bored of that. Oh my god, yes, you can. But like watching Pete try. Um, not at the moment. This season's been banging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you do make a point there. It's just like the fatigue of him winning so much. But like you say, you and like stuff. Every sport goes through phases where there are like teams. Verstappen. Yeah, there are just yeah. teams or individuals who are just more dominant. And it's just we, cycling has gone through so many phases of different riders, like through in the Grand Tours or Cancellara in 
whatever on, and mercs like god god knows what we would have been what twitter would have been like if i was around when mercs was a thing it's just a phase like yeah well it won't last forever and i don't Hopefully think it's it will no oh, not Trevanderpool forever n- n- no well, he doesn't yeah have... i hope so he's i quite i quite like him i like him as well i don't think it's personal against him you know with Froome, you could say, oh, he's boring. The team is, is has, has all these question marks around it, yada, yada, yada. Where it's like, Matthew van der Poel is like, you know, he's cycling his own action man toy. You know, he's like pristine. He's strong on the bike. He's an aesthetically like pleasing rider. Like he just looks powerful. He's got this whole pathos with his grandfather and his own father. He's from a cycling sort of homeland in the Netherlands, but also has the Belgian cards to play. He's born and raised in Belgium, has a Flemish accent when he speaks Dutch, you know, so I, f- I feel like he is very much, like, the epitome of cycling, so I don't I don't think it's necessarily against him or his team, I think, if anything the Alperson story is endearing of the fact that it was, like, a pro-continental team, and then kind of rallied around Van der Poel, became a World Tour team only 12 months ago and they're getting all this success now, so I'm I, I think it, it, it more is just fatigue of just, oh, I'm tired of the same person winning. If it were Alvin Art, it would have been the same thing. But he doesn't win monuments, so it wasn't him. Oh, come on. You're just kidding and jabbing on Wilder. But he doesn't win Dwarves Door of London. Oh, and that was. Oh, oh guys. Listen, he's the reason why he's having a hard time at, at the moment. All right, it's just. They'll bounce back. Oh. <laughs> Well, speaking of this Billy bike, uh, or of the Bath Country, how was that? Oh, that went out better for them, didn't it? Jesus Christ, what an absolute mess of a race this was. This was this was very a la Tour of Polonia when there was the whole Jakobsen thing and just the whole rest of the race just had this tainted feel to it. It felt kind of like that. But, oh, God. It was still an okay race. I know people will be like, oh, it was awful because of all the crashing. And, you know, that's fair. But Roglic crashes all the time. So, you know, that wasn't really, wasn't really anything new there. But the week but, started with Roglic winning. And even winning when he went the wrong way towards the finish uh, on the time trial. Roglic was back. Everything was looking good. And, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, then I mean, it wasn't because of one corner with some... A, a bump in it, a tree root, and many bumps. Bump, I think. Some, the asphalt and stuff like that. Um, people blaming people were really, really heated on Twitter that day. Um, people saying things which they later redacted because they just can't control their emotions and just had to spew everything into a social media feed. People looking for blame, blaming the organizers, blaming tires, blaming hookless rims, blaming. <laughs> Um, drains blaming a geology blaming wh- whoever whoever they could do they were blaming at the end of the day I'm not sure if there is really blame to be put on whatever happened in Basque Country I think it just sadly happened and um, yeah I think it, it brought this whole discussion of how can you make cycling safer and I don't really know if you can Make a cycling chicane, safer. A chicane on every descent. Yes, put chicanes everywhere. Neutralize every single descent. Uh, you know, just introduce a halo system. I saw that idea somewhere. Like, how the hell? How the hell are you supposed to integrate a halo into a bike? How's that supposed to work? Airbags in uh, in cycling kit. My word, I don't even know where the spiel's going. It was just a bit of a round to me because I was just getting fed up of people just mm-hmm. spewing rubbish on Twitter. You know. Occupational hazards exist. If you, for instance, if you're a tree surgeon, sometimes you're going to fall out of that tree. If you are a doctor, sometimes you're going to get ill. You know, et cetera, et cetera. If if you're a bike racer, sometimes you crash. We don't need to blame anyone and everything for everything that happens. But this Basque Country was incredibly cursed. So many crashes even throughout the week. And then there was just this like sour taste as if someone had died. It was just very like tense and ominous. Um but I mean it provided it provided a very, very chaotic week of racing. A lot of like winners that I think will go down in history 
Uh, I use a winning overall. That makes sense. But just throughout the week, we just had some like very like fascinating wins. Uh, Louis Mankey's won a World Tour stage again. Good to see that. Quinton Hedemann's returned back to the top level. Who would have thought? Roman Gregoire won a reduced sprint towards the end in a bike throw against Maxi Schachmann. Like there were lots of like interesting and compelling narratives, but like this race is just going to be remembered for one thing. And yeah, I mean seeing Avonapol. Vingo and Roger Walker, George Gold crash in, in one big pileup is is never good to see, particularly Vingo, who's got, I mean, quite nasty injuries. Um, he's got something I can't remember the name of, but I think it's like a bruising of the lung. Um, also broken ribs, broken collarbone. Avon Pull as well, I think, has a broken collarbone. Roglic, I mean, he crashed a number of times during the week. And there was, there was a whole debate about whether he was concussed or not. I don't know what, what made Twitter users concussion experts but boy were they weighing in on it and i don't know i'm quite glad this race is done because there was just an infinite amount of twitter discourses about this and you know what i'm tired of having to have a debate about every single thing that pops up in the cycling world you know yeah and i'm on a weekly podcast talk about that yeah everyone had an opinion about how to make cycling safer and who was at fault i was like all saying you know all this injury that injury and being like oh no I, I, i'm sorry i said that and it's like how about just when people crash how about you just don't speculate and just don't say anything and you just wait for the update rather than trying to start blaming people or whatever just straight up just stop typing sometimes people for real for real um but any big takeaways from the race I mean, that the is still looks good he's still the I, real deal i think there were some decent takeaways i think firstly is that Roglic, that that Paris was certainly, I think, behind him from that one TT performance that we saw. It does show that that was obviously just a little bit of um, getting back into things. I think, yeah, there was some interesting kind of like all the kind of winners of stages were all relatively like puncher ask people, so it's hard to like gauge those things. Carlos Rodriguez winning a stage that was completely mad. Lidl Trek. Could do take anything. I mean, they, they were okay in supporting Skelmos, but he sadly lost. He lost. Right, this kind of wild me up. I don't know why, but Skelmos he lost second place in GC because of bonus seconds that were taken away from him needlessly by Mark Soler on that final stage. And I have no idea why Mark Soler had this absolute egregious against Skelmos. It's like a user's already won. This guy's just been hauling ass trying to just save his GC second place against Carlos Rodriguez, who you are not on the team of. And you've just gone and rolled Skelmosa for those four bonus seconds, which would have got him second. I don't know why Soler did this, and it did wind me up just a little bit. It's so Mark Soler. It really is. Um, so but it, it did make for a Spanish 1-2-3. So that was quite cool. Um, on that final stage, at least. Not on the final podium. So Spanish racing might actually be be, be back, you know? Spanish racing is back. I think it's so back. Arguably the one main thing to take away is is the injuries that were sustained by Roglic, Renko, Jonas going to influence their ability to perform at the Tour this year against, namely, Tade Pagacha, who's mm-hmm. doing the Giro Tour double. Because okay. Pagacha crashed in Liège last year and that influenced his tour. And these guys have crashed at a relatively similar time with arguably worse injuries. Oh, definitely worse. Like, yeah. So, certainly had a broken wrist. Well, so, only, but like. So is the Giro Tour the wall happen? I mean, the odds are definitely narrowing. Um, and just how the tables turn here. But I think Virgo is one in particular because it's also that the lung damage as well. I think that's going to be really hard to recover from. I'm no doctor. I have zero medical qualifications. Um, but I can't imagine recovering from what's the medical name? Pneumothorax is, is particularly easy. Those broken ribs and the broken collarbone will just make it incredibly uncomfortable to be in a bike for a very long time. He's going to miss out on all of that sort of altitude training. He might even miss out on the Dauphiné. You probably won't even see him racing until the Tour de France. That's going to put a lot of question marks around Vingegaard. For Avonapol, I think would, he has fewer injuries to recover from. Avonapol's bounce back from worse. 
I think he'll be okay in the Tour de France. I don't think he was necessarily the number one contender to win that race anyway, in, in, like, like Vingago is. And for Roglic, similarly, this is nothing new for him. He knows how, how to recover well. I think he'll be... Um, He'll he'll be sort of confident in this. I mean, I don't think he's had a major sort of crash related injury in his sort of major Grand Tour career so far. So this is gonna this is gonna be an interesting battle for him. In the same way that Bogacha didn't have a major crash until last year, and he had to sort of find his feet again and find a new sort of training pattern to get him ready for the Tour de France. It'll be fascinating to see how these guys build up whilst Poggy goes around Italy. But if we are to believe all the Twitter experts. There's more crashing in professional cycling. And in a wet Giro d'Italia, maybe Poggy is is the next rider to potentially crash. And in that case, are we looking at a David go do to the France victory? I mean No, <laughs> Sasha Blossom. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Sasha Blossom's <laughs> looking a million dollars right now, or a million rubles, which probably doesn't translate to many dollars. Um, he's looking a million rubles right now. So yeah, Sasha Vlasov, hundred percent. My bad. Apologies. Uh, Adam Gatchin did put a tweet up uh, following that crash. But yeah, I mean UAE. Obviously, they're not happy about anyone crashing. But yeah, suddenly the, pr- the prospect of that Giro Tour. But at the same time, they also lost Jay Vine, um in that crash oh, with yeah. a really, really nasty, um, uh, really nasty injuries i think he's got vertebrae vertebrae issues yeah. oh, he was second in the yeah. opening time trial in basque country as well so he's a, he was in good form and he was supposed to go to the giro with pogaccia so friend of the oh, echelon cycling podcast as well yeah ah, yes nice guy as well nice guy a very nice guy i wonder who will send the giro instead I've, they've got lots of people del toro send del toro yeah, to the giro for real They've, they've been sending him to so many Grand Tour, well, so sorry, so many World Tour level races this year so far. He has the confidence of the team. He's finished in top ten at every single World Tour stage race he's done. He's done three. He is the real deal. I'd quite like to see him there. It's almost starting to be like a bit like the 2012 this this uh, kind of Giro Tour quest or whatever for Bogaccia. It's almost like Bradley Wiggins with uh, him trying to win the Tour de France, where everything just lined up. The course was perfect. Uh, Contador was out on his doping suspension. Schlecht was nothing near what he used to be. Uh, and it's looking like the stars are aligning for Pogaccio right now. Is Pogaccio like the only main threat for Liège now? <laughs> is, that yeah. just, like, is that a walkover? Now? No, Macho Vanderpool is there. I mean, not a lot of dude when Poggy <laughs> lights it up. I don't think so. But, but you know, we can live, we can live in dreams. We can live in dreams as well. But, but yeah, okay. Anyway, with uh, Jonas Vingor sustaining the lung injury, the uh, I mean, the broken ribs, the collarbone, all of this, all of this is like you and said, going to take a long time to heal up. What does he do with his 2024 uh, season? I mean, we did a video like this about Wild Van Aert. I didn't think we were going to do another one for the rest of this year, but here we are. Yeah, it's it it does probably require a major sort of think an existential redraw of the plan uh the Christian Dauphiné in just two months time I think is probably going to be off the table um given that he'll have to recover for, from these injuries and he, even the Tour de France preparation in itself could be up um in question he'll be sort of not happy to see that Wout Van Aert has a better chance of going to the Tour de France but if Wout will be at, at the Tour de France that will certainly uh, be useful for a recovering um Jonas Vingol but <laughs> I mean, we don't know how, how long it is going to take. That is the the, the big thing in question. If, if anybody has any insights of how long it does take for for people to recover from, from these kind of injuries, then do let us know in the comment section down below. If you can't go to the Tour, then I'm sh- I bet you'd be able to go to the Vuelta. In which case, should he just be off the Tour? No. Uh, why not? Can't. Send Sepp Kuss. Like, why send a when he won his bingo to the Tour? Sepp's not winning. He's not been allowed into the yeah, breakaway but... to get a soft Grand Tour victory. But but Scott Scott, how like, what do you mean by by just like canning off the Tour de France? Like, if, 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 if he doesn't have anything else planned planned for July, why not just make him go? Because what if he finishes 18th instead of winning it? And 
I just don't want to see you on us and our eyes top form and kind of. I think it's the defending champ. You almost. It's not like an obligation. Well, I'll say that to Bradley Wiggins in 2013. Wiggins was an enigma. He just he he, he didn't follow the rules. No. Jonas is Jonas is a a caring, just you know, <laughs> a, a obliging person. He he will want to be at the tour. Yeah. I don't see a world where Jonas doesn't where, where where Jonas doesn't go to the tour, even if he isn't in in great form. The whole I, I don't know. I, I think that he will. You kind of just have to put him there and just see what happens. Even if he's in an absolute just not fit state and he's still in like a hospital bed, then no, he can't. But if he's able to do a, a decent amount of training, I think you just kind of have to really just do a forty percent hail mary uh, goal. Yeah, just hope he gets up to like eighty percent by the end. I would skip the tour and go to the welter. Win but that. Then- but then this could be a training road for the Belter. Ah, okay. Yeah, it could be. Where else are going to go? The Tour of Austria? <laughs> oh, my word, imagine. It's not out of the question that Jonas could definitely do like a, a tour of Welter double, I think. Well, I don't know. I, I say that. It depends how he recovers from this. It's going to be a complete, like, if he doesn't go to a doping, we are just going to have absolutely zilch idea until he rocks up. And even if he doesn't do well in the first week, that doesn't mean that when we get later on into the race, that that he won't be firing on all cylinders. But what about the like mental aspect as well, like crashing like that? He has a family as well now, so it's. Yeah. It can I, take as solace. you and said before, this is his first big crash. He can take solace in the fact that Remco and Robert also crashed, so at least he's not starting from like a lower point. And Poggy's coming off of a Giro, so maybe he's like not on a hundred percent. That's the that's the only thing he could take Solson. And similarly, Pogacar crashed and recovered in time. Yes, to finish second in, in the Tour de France, but he gave gave it a good go. But that was a race. That wasn't like a long ribbed. Yes, collarbone. I know, I know, I know. Like, like, like the lungs is like you know, yeah. in their lungs you need them. Um. I mean, you need a wrist as well. He might not also have have sort of past experiences to sort of get him down as well. He might have that sort of naivety of this being his first, um, his first injury. So he has the ability to sort of like, oh, whatever, I'll see what happens, see what comes my way, instead of feeling a little bit futile. But at the same time as well, he doesn't know what works for him when recovering from a broken collarbone, which is a common injury for cyclists or to for, for recovering from from lung injuries or or, or whatever. But I'm sure. Visma Lisa like have the doctors on hand to help. They are one of the tip top teams in the world, probably the most tip top team in the world, and they will have all the resources and support for him to come back in fighting form for the Tour de France. And if not, I mean a Bolter Espana victory should be in the bag. Poggy's not going there. You could say because we we were all going into maybe the tour this year thinking, oh, you know. Poggy being the main competitor to Jonas, but doing the Giro, oh, that's going to sort of scupper his chances. But in a rather sadistic way, and please, take this the right way, but Jonas crashing might give us a more entertaining tour de France because Poggy's going to be not perfect after the Giro and this slightly turmoiled preparation that Jonas is going to have for the tour could mean that we actually have a relatively close tour de France because none of their preparations is going to be absolutely ideal rather than it being Jonas is just going to drop everyone and just walk off the victory we could actually end up with a more entertaining tour which as fans is going to be great but obviously that has come rather sadly at the at the uh, expense of other people's injuries yeah and also in the first week of this year's Tour de France, there's a lot of climbing. So if he's not quite there yet in that first week, that could be a downfall for him. But to his advantage, if he does sort of ride into form like he has done in the past couple of Tour de France's anyway, there are some crucial stages in stages 18 and 19 where he could really make make the difference um, ahead of that final time trial. So I do have have some belief it's going to take a lot of, of soul-searching for him to, to get back to this level. But I believe he will still be in contention for the Tour de France. And if he's nowhere near that form, I actually don't think he, they'll send him. I don't think they'll take the risk. 
Exactly. That's what I said. And now you no, but, cut no, 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 no. But like, if he is ready, like, like no. Uh, in terms of like, they shouldn't wipe it off his schedule now. That's what I'm thinking. They oh, shouldn't right. sort of okay. take like accept it like okay boom to the france is gone you know they should still try to work towards that point if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out he does other things you know he's not the first reigning champion to miss out on on retaining his Tour de france trophy are you not a bit nervous uh, with some of the crashes we've seen like remco venable in lombardia egon bernal with the bus through as well it takes a long time before they get back and sometimes they might never get back to where they were mm. i mean Gatches wasn't, yeah, it was a wrist. It wasn't this kind of level. Yeah, it, it does. It does make me, make me worry. Um, he's also at this kind of critical point in his career where he's reaching his physical peak. And if you sort of using this time to sort of recuperate from a crash, we might have seen the best of Vago in the rear view mirror. But um, it, it, it might take much longer than. The what six months? No, not even six months. How long is it to the Tour de France? Three months. Um, it it might take two years. It might take a whole season for him, for him to bounce back. But this is Jonas Vingegaard. You know, he's got the, those insane statistics. Um, that VO two max, all this power output, yada yada yada, that people love to sort of, uh, people love to to share. So, I think I think he will will return to the tip top level. Anyways, we might as well finish with our last segment that is a bit lighter. Uh, Amstel Gold is coming, and in 2019, we had a very exciting edition. So that was Mr. Macho Annapol who won that. We've already spoken to about him, so we might as well finish with him. Is he the favorite for Amstel Gold this week? Probably, yes. I'd, I'd say he <laughs> is. End of story. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that Alpsin... They've got the momentum, you know. They're all in high spirits. Vanderpool is clearly in fantastic form. He's his lowest finishing in a race this year is tenth. That was even when he was helping Jasper Phillips. And so I think that Vanderpool is the main contender, especially when you consider that guys like Wout and Poggy aren't coming to this race. You know, that certainly helps him out. I'm just looking at the stylist now, trying to find some other names who might provide a little bit of competition. A user will be interesting to see. Uh, Michael Matthews, if it came to a sprint. Pidcock, don't know how he's recovering. Um, maybe even Jasper Phillips, so maybe it might be in kind of inside his own team that he might be looking for a threat. Skelmos has been looking good as well, Maxine Van Hills, but I mean, even just rattling off those names, it kind of just. It just makes me feel like nobody's quite on the same level as Vanderpool. I'm not sure if a par cause is the same as when he won in 2019, but uh, yeah, I think that he probably is the favourite. But whether they might try and keep Philipson in the port, like in in the fray for as long as possible, I don't know, or whether they'll just go team like full in Vanderpool. I think there's too much climbing for Philipson. In my in my yeah. personal humble opinion. Um, but looking at this start list, yes, he is the favorite. He's not going to win it like he did at sort of Ronda and Roubaix, where he like goes away with 50k to go and wins by two, three minutes. But, um, he is probably the strongest rider in the star line. He will be sort of the most marked man, but anything can happen in, in Amstel Gold. Out of a lot of these spring classics, I think this one is also the one that kind of opens up and can be the most unpredictable. You see characters rise to the top that you weren't expecting. Uh, we've seen some guys definitely improving in form. Ben Healy has been quietly work, chipping away and improving his form. Uh, he was a circuit uh, de la Loire, whatever it's called, over in France last week, being a really, really strong and valiant teammate. Maxi Schachmann was looking quite good last week at Basque Country. He's uh, finished on the podium in this race in the past. I'm really hopeful for Ayuso. Um, then you've got Groupama, who've just been pretty consistent in, in the classics over the past two years. They've got plenty of cards to play. I think this race won't be as easy for for Van der Poel, but with uh, with a strong excellence, with Son Carlson who's looked good in this race in the past, Hermans who won a race recently as well, and Michael Gogol who's always super reliable, then he is probably going, going to be starting as number one. But other teams have a legitimate chance of dethroning him. I think. 
Even like Stephen Williams, sorry, I'm just looking at this. Yeah. Because our Premier League, like, they, they've got a really strong team. Dylan Tones is looking quite strong again. Michael Woods, who is, you can never count him out. But Stephen Williams looked fantastic a couple weeks back. And they've got Corbin strong as well if it comes down to a sprint. That could be a real wildcard team to bother Albus and Dakota. Yeah. Um, and the French Luxenko is here, Kevin Vaucola. Maybe he could, he could just, you know, put a cat amongst the pigeons as well. I just I do see it quite hard outside of a scenario of we get to the Kalberg and Van der Poel goes all right I'm going to attack now let's see who can stay with me and I just I'm really struggling to see somebody who's going to be able to stick with them yeah I do see it being a bit it might be a bit like Poggy last year at Amstel where he just soloed off to victory but at least he's on home soil so maybe he won't get a cap or beer or whatever thrown at him this time I mean, he will get a bit on the final podium, though. Amstel Gold, sponsored by Amstel, one of the best-selling beers in the world. But with that, uh, we might as well come to Rider of the Week. <laughs> what a segue. Uh, yeah, who is your Rider of the Week, and why is it Macho Van der Poel? Who is picking Macho Van der Poel? Nobody? It's, it's low-hanging fruit, you know. I've got a couple of names in mind. One of them based upon how they actually performed in a race. One of them may space more upon morals. I'm going to say my rider week is Stefan Krausvik for selflessly checking on not just Jonas Vingegaard, but also all of the, or most of the, however many crash riders that were on the floor. And he went around and alerted all the medical staff. So I think that Stefan Krausvik, not for on bike performances and winning, but for being a good human. Well, low hanging fruit tastes the sweetest. Matthew Van der Poel is my rider of the week. He won yeah. Rebe by three minutes. This might this might go down as his magnum opus. Oh, we're gonna pick now. And Josh Tarling for getting disqualified. Oh yeah, let's talk have, about that. That was you got been not, to the that. yeah. That was that was a, a fascinating moment. It was just so blatantly caught on camera as well. Does this happen more more often than than, than we? than we're aware of was was it just sort of disqualified what was it a disqualification offense because it was so blatantly caught on camera he's not my writer of the week anyway um good 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 oh. i'm gonna pick mouse person because he's the first day i can remember we didn't even talk about the pyro bay uh espoir where it was a one-two finish for the serenian team yes as you and didn't mention it um yeah I can't really, I can't remember the names, but in the other one, the Espoir, it was Tim Ton Turtenberg, who has one of the best names in cycling. Um, isn't that the one to 23? Oh, because Albert yeah, Phillipson you know. finished fourth in the Espoir race. Which, she, oh, do you know, did you, did you watch the final, the final couple of kilometers of that one? No. F- F- Phillipson was wild. Um, he was just like kind of played around, crashed earlier on, and he just like kind of like threw it away when he got into the velodrome and just like kind of like tried to ride away like like a, like a child. He he like he rode with zero tactics. So Albert Phillipson, when you side wall tour with Lionel Trek, please please fix up on on your tactics. Otherwise, your teammate Tim Torn Tordenberg is going to be the team leader at Lionel Trek. That's a lot of teaser. The reason I, I like Mass Pilsen because not only is his first day in, I can remember to finish on the podium, but also because coming into the velodrome with the prospect of Jasper Philipsen and uh, yeah, trying to beat him in a sprint, he almost kind of deliberately uh, blocked him with Nils Pollard, but just just quite didn't work. He was like using Nils Pollard to try and block Jasper Philipsen in, but it, it qu- just quite didn't work. But anyways, we're coming to the end of episode 63 and uh, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel here on the YouTube channel or subscribe or whatever you do on uh, Spotify. And uh, if you haven't already, check us out on uh, Twitter as well or Patrick, Ewan, etc. And of course, as always, thank you for watching and we will see you next week.